Dr. Dorothy Yancey is president of Johnson C. Smith University in Charlotte, North Carolina. Dr. Dr. Dorothy Yancey is president of the Johnson C. Smith University and was first came to the university as a student and then returned in 1994 to serve as the first woman appointed to the position. And previously, Dr. Yancey served as professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology for 22 years. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in History and Social Science from Johnson C. Smith University, a Master of Arts degree from History from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and a PhD in Political Science from Atlanta University. Chairman Miller, Ranking Member McKeon, I appear before you today to thank you uh, for passing the College Opportunity and Affordability Act of 2007 and reauthorizing and strengthening the Higher Education Act of 1965. I come from the 12th District uh, in North Carolina, Johnson C. Smith University, uh, the home of Congressman uh, Mel Watt. I appear before you to share some of the many ways in which provisions in this act has helped Johnson C. Smith become a leader among private liberal arts colleges. As I always say at Johnson C. Smith, we've always been able to wash clothes without washing powder. Uh, we have been recognized, that's right, we've had so little for so long that we've learned to live with it, but we could always use more. We have a small endowment of $53 million, and we're the beneficiary of the Duke Indenture. Over the years, we've been recognized by U.S. News and World Report as one of the best comprehensive colleges in the South since 2001. We are recognized as the first and only HBCU laptop uh, university where all students are given laptops. In 2007, we were also ranked in the top 10 of HBCUs in America by U.S. News and World Report. But we are most proud of what happened in 2000 when Yahoo ranked JCSU as one of the top 50 most wired small colleges. I therefore encourage you to, to, to settle in all of your differences on how six, uh, HR 694 the Minority uh, Servant Institution uh, Act regarding digital and wirelessness, because we all need that. Most of our students, so many of our schools, are only 88% in terms of their connectivity, uh, in terms of just the basic connectivity. And 45% of the students at our schools, HBCUs, do not have, uh, have uh, laptops. Uh, I'd also uh, like to, to uh, remind you as to why we exist. Uh, we, we exist because we serve a particular a population. Uh, we were created at a particular time when special purpose institutions were created, as you've already mentioned. But we must remind you constantly that we are, uh, we are not obsolete, that we must continue to exist. If we didn't exist, you would have to create us. The most powerful reason for our existence has to do with economics. Educational pre preparation results in higher income levels, strengthens America's society. Everyone knows that a college graduate will always earn more than a non-college graduate, even though we know that the average African American with a bachelor's degree will earn $1.7 million a year in a lifetime, whereas a white college graduate will earn around $2.1 uh, million. We play a critical role in fulfilling the higher education gap, and we plug what we call the economic gap, which was first identified by the Kerner Commission. You've already stated that there are so few of us, 4%, yet we graduate so many, 30% of African-American students. But there is another problem here. According to the data from the NSF, six of the top 20 predominantly white institutions receive more federal funds for research than 79 HBCUs combined. If we are to have adequate research facilities and if we are to be competitive, we must receive more federal funds for research. I would argue that a continued investment in HBCUs is a good investment for this country and for this nation. Johnson C. Smith was created in 1867 by the Presbyterian Church. And somewhere along the way, you know, Presbyterians can be quite feisty. We seceded from the church in 1868, and so we've been an independent institution ever since. But there is something I really would like to thank you for, and that has to be the Title III uh, funding. Title III, since 1997, Johnson C. Smith has received more than $17.5 million. We have used these funds and we have pinched the pennies. We have developed technology infrastructures. We've dealt with aging facilities, maintenance upgrades and renovations. We've dealt with personnel resources, personal resources. We've dealt with data management infrastructures, institutional planning and effectiveness and assessment, and student success and persistence to graduation. And we've also looked at alternative funding. But we've also institutionalized many of the programs that we have started. We, for example, have built an information center, an office of mobile computing. We have an institutional planning assessment and effectiveness program.
sponsored programs, research, academic retention and support services, faculty development, facilities management, tutorial services, and discipline-based computer technology. What I'm trying to tell you is that you've given us some dollars. We've taken these dollars and we've institutionalized them. We have not simply thrown them to the wind. The one concern that I have here is Title IV. Title IV is a great program. 83% of my students are receiving financial aid. But as I look at my students, they are been, being uh, impacted disproportionately by the economy. For example, we have this year 1,000 students applied for the family, I call them parent loans. Only 500 of them qualified because of bad debt. That meant that many of those students had to go to alternative loans, which have high interest rates. Of those students, I had 15% of my students acquiring alternative loans. So you need to understand that the economy has impacted us. I read an article that came out yesterday that said less than 10% of the students in this country were getting alternative loans, and they were all at for-profit institutions. That simply is not true. They are also attending our schools, and they are being impacted in a disproportionate way. I would argue that Pell has to be increased, which you've already agreed to. I would argue that the Title II teacher quality enhancement provision has to be strengthened. I would argue that in terms of challenges, endowments have to be dealt with. We probably have one institution with an endowment of more than $500 million. That is a crisis. You have to have money in order to continue to strengthen your programs, pay for your, pay your bills, and just do the things that you have to do to have a successful institution. The other thing that we need to look at is sustaining leadership within our institutions. I'm retiring. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> but I also know that the pipeline of presidents, CFOs, provosts, et cetera, is fairly thin. And there also needs to be something done about the training of trustees and people who sit on these boards from the state levels who determine what happened in our institutions. Sometimes they know little or nothing about education, but they become experts once they're appointed. But that's about all I have to say. I'll take questions afterwards. Thank you very much for your time.